and also using an assessment criteria rather than a linear case study uh, for it to create a digital portfolio on the learning journey of technology. So therefore, it was a divergent, not best fit model, which I found many issues in the institution. Uh, there was also uh, value for social learning, so it's thought that the scheme encouraged social learning that worked favourably with the perspective of our education rather than a didactic learning style. Therefore, we adopted our community and inquiry approach to encourage open ended sessions, tutorial or mentorship opportunities, and access to student choice, and have the communities uh, feedback at the heart of practice. And finally, there were challenging traditional teaching for expectations where instead of having a set lecture in the teaching, uh, I currently being the curriculum design and the learning teacher or facilitator of the work, and I'm a student, so I adopt many roles. And that was because we wanted to break down the traditional dynamic between a lecturer and the student. Um, so, yeah, so that's what we decided to have, which made our own mental framework. Uh, so, John Turner, having moved from Charmaine Brooks, previously argued that a lot of online higher education uh, opportunities that affected that flexible access, cost effectiveness, and interactive learning could not be achieved at once. But our aim was to make this a reality. Uh, so, this is what the new uh, Tower Champion scheme looks like. We spent two months from September to November, October, sorry, 2022, uh, using the online platform Canvas. Um, which you will see in this animation slide here, uh, where students had to create the digital portfolio that explains their own technological journey, mm -hmm. whether it's for academic, personal, entrepreneurial, or research oriented reasons. Uh, we currently have 14 students ranging from undergraduate to doctoral, alongside five other nine and five members of staff who are also uh, learning at the university as well. Uh, the Tower Champion Scheme promotes learning opportunities on a monthly theme. This has included uh, social media, networking, videos, broadcasting, podcasting, creating a digital brand or identity, artificial intelligence, and virtual reality. So, as you can see, the learning development that we do on our open learning platform is very much with the heart of what's currently going on in the technological world. Uh, participants can access this anytime, anywhere, to learn at their own pace. Uh, here are some of the examples of the resources we use with the Tower Champion Scheme. So, you can see here on the left, uh, we have lots of uh, open learning uh, resources as well as ones that we create ourselves. This includes uh, we're partnered with the Duke of York uh, Idea Awards, where students can learn at their own pace, uh, bite sized interactive uh, courses, and get a nationally recognised qualification on top of the extra interesting we're doing now. Uh, on the right, you can see the reading materials we have. So we use open non for profit platforms such as this archive, where students can access uh, digital uh, readings, uh, audio, and video files, and Project Gutenberg as well. On the bottom right, you can see some of the uh, AI tools that we use, which we consider co creators, which include ChatGPT, but also other ones that aren't at the forefront of everyone's minds, such as Mid Journey and Pseudo, to name a few. So in February and March 2023, uh, we did a series of semi-structured interviews for the current participants of the scheme to find out what the next steps could be. Uh, total of 14 to 24 participants responded. Uh, so with the survey feedback that we did, um, you can see we had a range of both positive uh, feedback and some things that were important to consider in the future. Um, so with the Canvas module, uh, students liked the way it combined online learning and fully accessible way of our needs, providing little or no cost. Uh, the fact that students can uh, collaborate on the scheme together or independently. The fact that with their learning journey, creating digital portfolio, there was no restrictions. It was just a case study to please their own department. It was that was more free and personal to them. Uh, the only feedback that we had that we given us thought was that a lot of students wanted the uh, open learning platform to have more of our own resources because obviously we use quite a lot of our own at this stage, but it's something we're working with at the moment. And the main feedback we got is that there was only uh, one senior tower developer, me. Uh, a student uh, said, You cannot be replicated if someone else ends up taking over the role or help share the workload and warranty the quality and vision of the scheme will be lost, which is obviously something that I'll have to uh, give consideration for in the future. Uh, so the Tower Champs needs some positive results of ambitious expanding prospects. It also presents several implications, uh, such an extracurricular program with a co 
creation of models, very much dependent on the effectiveness and adaptability of me and my school team, uh, being both the learning designer and co-creator. Uh, we are in discussions to uh, work with other organisations, such as Pandemic, Rubble Teaching and more. Uh, and thankfully, uh, because of the scheme, this September, we have uh, interest of over 100 students, which is quite a big prize that we're looking forward to. Uh, so yes, we have a couple of next steps we could probably go over, which is uh, currently we're looking at creating a spin-out opportunity uh, with the University of Management, which will allow the continuation of the sort of champion scheme, it brought us more freedom resources and funding, which is vital at the moment to quite a small budget, developing crucial partnerships to turn on externals to where we are now, and proceed to create a divergent model to explore funding avenues for scheme support. Um, so yeah, so that's my list of stuff for the Champion Scheme. If you do want to learn more about it uh, or any aspect of that, um, then do let me know. And uh, yeah, thank you very much. Jennifer, we've got a couple of minutes for questions. Anyone have a question for Jennifer? Yes, please. I was just briefly googling the Stealth Champion Scheme. So I get a couple of books that uh, come up, but basically they describe what the scheme is, and then there's an email address I can contact. I guess that goes to you. Uh, but is it something that you can access from outside of the university at all? Uh, good question. I've been the nervous talks to be a little bit my first time presenting at a conference ever. So uh, currently we are, are we in a pilot year where it's open to anyone in the university community, but the aim is for this September for it to be launched so it's openly available to the public. Um, and the reason for that is simply because uh, like I earlier mentioned, some of the tensions with, uh, you know, uh, executive leadership and the requirements of the university is that they wanted the pilot scheme to be uh, closed before we opened it, just to make sure that we get uh, the maximum amount of feedback and in the case we launch it and then people have mixed feedback and then we kind of go, we've got to go back to square one. So, yeah, I'm sure that's Other questions? Yeah, Jennifer, you have a question. Um, uh, you mentioned some of the kind of mindset issues uh, in terms of kind of uh, all these practitioners having a uh, uh, sense of kind of learning and teaching more than like this, you know, really serious. What, what, what would be one or two kind of biggest challenges in terms of uh, mindset? Uh, in terms of like having an open platform? Yeah, and, or yeah, just you know, supporting practitioners think differently about the ways in which they can be teaching. I think the thing is, is that again, because I'm fortunate to be both a student and a teacher, I have the possibility to do this. And at my university, um, it's very hard, apart from their main like core responsibilities, to you know do an extra curricular program like this. However, what we are looking into is potentially having, for example, lecturers and staff doing like guest workshops or guest sessions, so they can still have an involvement in it, but it doesn't compromise their commitments to the university. Um, but yeah, it is to be challenged, like I said in the feedback. Uh, it is mainly me with my school team yeah. of six, but um, yeah, but frankly, we're looking for ways to kind of integrate that so it's more um, fluid and easy. Thank you, once again. So we'll thank you. Hello everyone. Good morning. So how many of you have um, recovered from last night? <laughs> how many of you haven't recovered? <laughs> how many of you would just like to be honest that I'm not going to be many today? Right, I'm going to take a photo of everybody. If you do not want to be in this picture, open your faces now. You'll see why when I three more a week in this event. Okay, so hi, I'm Andrew Smith. I work for the Open University for the last 25 years. I've been working with vendor technologists, corporations like Cisco, Microsoft, Amazon, Comptia, basically all the great Satans in, the, in our industry. I mean, you can look at the slide deck, you can see who I am. I've worked in further education, I've worked in higher education, I've worked in national qualifications in the UK. But I mainly work in a way that we can enable young people, older people, become slightly dangerous in our industry. Some of it, how many of you have taught computer science or something equivalent in the past? Yeah? 
How many of you love teaching theory? Stop it. <laughs> but how many of you want your students to go out and get a job and actually do something practical? That, that, that's the right answer, by the way. Okay? But the important thing is, we've got lots of theory, we've got lots of curriculum, which is good and has got a solid foundation, but I need to work with organisations that have got the resources that will enable my students or other individuals to go out and it's a funny thing. Get a job. Yeah? That, that funny old job thing. Yeah. Journey. So I've been working with the Cisco Net Account program for all of this time, for 25 years almost. If you don't know, Cisco, Large Silicon Valley Corporation, they make little things like routers, switches. And I noticed that we're actually using their WebEx software at the moment to broadcast this as well. Okay? Um, they're, they're like every corporation, they're in it for the money, they're in it for the shareholders, they're in it for profit, but they do have a good idea of corporate social responsibility, enablement, engagement, yeah, they'll work with underserved communities, and they actually have a great program that's got all the right things in the coding, networking, cyber, IoT, whatever jargon you want, um, skill set. Historically, um, it was very much a pyramid selling program. A bit of a policy scheme sometimes, where they would have academy support centers, or regional academies like the one I used to run, that we would go, go and train other organizations. So we would go to a school or a college or a university, get them to pay us in order to support them and develop them. That worked really well when there was money. Worked really well when there was an economic crash. It worked really well when it was sort of the up and coming trendy skill. But we had a problem. In the UK, um, we were having schools, colleges, different places like here at UHI that couldn't afford to maintain it because it didn't necessarily match national qualification requirements. Or financial requirements of so paying three thousand a year when you didn't have to do it, and spending fifteen thousand pounds worth or more on equipment didn't always work. So it was beginning to struggle. The, yeah, Cisco had quite a protectionist view of their curriculum, like Microsoft, like all the others. Yeah, they said, it's all right, we've created it, we own it. And yeah, what was happening? was that the market was diminishing. We were seeing fewer and fewer network engineering students. I was seeing my numbers in my university shrink. I was getting a little emotional. I liked my job. Jeff's smiling because he knows exactly what I'm all about. But the support organizations were still charging for support even though they were losing customers. Continually doing the model. So I was approached in 2014 to join this city and come up and sort of develop a new model. And we recognized very quickly they had the potential to um, offer resources for free. So we were speaking to all the academy support centers in the UK and asking them, you know, let's see what we can do about it. What will we do? So we did nothing. <laughs> Now, there are actually some word, rude words here, but they think all. They kept doing the same thing. If you keep doing the same thing and you're wrong, or it's not growing, there's a problem, isn't it? You've got to change. And they were still charging for support. They were charging for teacher or instructor training as well, which wasn't working. So, I put myself a packet of matches, I put myself a pound of kerosene, and I started giving it away in 20. So all of the, yeah, we picked up a few organisations, and we said to them, "You can now have it for nothing. We're just going to give it away. You can have it for free. We're getting it for free. You can have it for free." And we started offering teacher training via social media. So I have been at your city conferences in the past. You can Google my work on Teacher by Twitter or Teacher by Facebook. And we actually flipped the model found a way of getting it out to the educators in a time scale that worked for them and getting it 
comes to the schools, colleges, and universities in a model that works for them. That's why I know you guys are interested in some of the candidates as well. Okay. I know better. Small or dot com business company. Okay. And what if we started with the matches? If we start with the fire, some of the academies hated us. I won't say the words that they use, but in certain way, there were some serious abuse. As we were checking, we were upsetting the market. They, they were in this Ponzi scheme and they were addicted to money. Nothing wrong with money, it's just how do you bring that in? So many more, once they realized what was going on, saw how it was actually going to open up the opportunity for them and explore markets and actually teach them that they couldn't talk to someone because it was free. So, no corporate social responsibility of a function within a large organization to make money were bemused, but they decided to watch and wait. There was this mad guy running around with matches. He's found other people that have had their own boxes of matches as well. And he just didn't see what the communities would do to cure some survival economics. The reality is, it grew. It grew considerably. So, at, at my lowest, I had about 400 students. Now, some of you know the other university that we teach at scale. So some of our modules have two to three thousand students a presentation. Okay, we are not small. So six hundred to us is chicken food. Okay, that is yeah, that is the scope of our organisation. But through investing in the community, it grew and it grew. We grew the number of students in the whole community. So as we grew to about 5,000 at this precise moment, our community grew from 3,000 to that. But at this precise moment, we've got about 35,000 students studying and accessing all of this content, or their organizations are getting it free. We started with 50. I've now reached about 16,000 educators, and that's growing. We only have 10 organizations. Now we've got 327, and we're starting to give them away and building other support organizations as well, where we're creating new communities of practice, where they're doing our semi-open, open, semi-free model as well. Mm -hmm. And we found alternate income and funding opportunities. Suddenly, Cisco wants to give us money to work with people with disabilities work with underserved communities. I've actually got a bid that should be awarded recently for gender participation within the sector. So they are they like what we do in so much as we get to people that other beers cannot reach. Some of you know that I'm first you know the joke. And we've now gone from just being in the UK to having you know, working in about 40 plus organizations. I was here on Tuesday speaking with the Cisco team here in UHI because they are now, you are now, going to be part of the growing Scottish community. Yes, so we're building a Scottish uh, Cisco community. We've got a Northern Irish, a Welsh, obviously an English, but we're growing it in different ways, sharing the model, sharing the freedom, sharing the opportunity. And that's fine. Yes. Yeah. So, I'm a bit of a card to file. That's us now. I mean, I could zoom in on the UK, but it's just it's a zit fest. But the beauty of this is all of these organizations around the world have seen what we're doing. Everybody does it slightly different. That's the beauty of open source. Yeah, my model, their model, yeah, they've got different ways of approaching this. I don't care if they teach 10 students or 100 or 1,000. So we've got organizations like the Royal College for the Blind in Hereford. If they reach 10 students a year, they're doing really well. But fantastic, vision impaired students have got access to this. We work with the Arab Open University. Curtin University actually work within the Indian Ocean Rim with vision impaired students as well. We're giving them the resources that they couldn't have afforded to have done under the Alpine scheme personally. And our ability to make income to cover the costs. Now, we give it away, they're actually able to make the income to keep themselves in a job and 
the name on the string as well. So I'm a fire starter. I'm a twisted fire starter. I'm a serial instigator. Okay, so that's the words. Any of you know the prodigy? Yeah, classical music. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I'm not totally literally taking the lyrics from this song. You might have noticed that some of the headings. But myself and others decided that things weren't working back about 10 years ago, about 10 years ago. And we started a fire under a large Silicon Valley Corporation CSR program, and it's worked. And we're now reaching people. We've now got them to be to move from a closed model to a semi open model. They're now creating self enrollment resources, they're creating publicly available resources. Anyone in this room access this to teach their students. Yeah, simple terms and conditions, you just have to sign up to their program. This isn't a sales pitch. But what they're also stopping the view is that you don't have to buy anything from them. They want that social engagement. They want that enablement because they want to see more people learn how to use technology. And they've made their curriculum more open standards based as well. So it's no longer the piece of the chest saying Cisco into the empire and all that kind of stuff. It's very much, here's how the rest of the world does it. And by the way, this is our Cisco implementation. So we're now moving to a new model, as I just said, with UHI, where we're now building up communities around the world to become independent of us and start growing in their own way as well. That's it. It's simple, it's short, and it's about speaking more. The QR code for the slide deck as well. So any questions or oh my god, who's a strange man? Hello, Jen. <laughs> so I'm summing up already. Yeah, but it's true, but I have one question. So you I you told me you work with the open university. I work for the for the right. But then in the slide it said with OU and we are working with OU and other partners. So I was like a little confused. Yeah, okay, so I work with a lot. So I am not the only I am open university, but I've got people at UHI. At Winchester, at a so we is the network. Yeah. So right. my, so my friend Rebecca, who works at the University of Bedfordshire, is one of my partners in Brom. Yeah, yeah, I gave yeah. her a box of matches once. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, okay. I have other partners in Prime as well. And sometimes they've gone off and bought their own matches and their little can of petrol. Gotcha. And they've worked out how to do it. But we are a community. We work together. I think one of the very good question. Yeah, if you're permitted, we've had it. Could you talk a bit more about how this scheme is funded? Because that's probably the main step going from A to B. So in the UK, some of our academies charge directly. We've got some courses where I give it away free to attract people. I've got some programs where I've got government funding or charitable funding, or corporate funding. So it's about to, once you build up enough of a community, you can go find the funding. So does the university pay me to do this? No, but do we have a mission for widening participation and an interest in growing our own customer base? Yes. So how is it funded? Well, I'm getting more students that are paying in the UK fees. So that slide way, way back. That was 600. Well, that was 600 students on, you know, on the percentage of university grant or loan fees. That's now 5,000 students, proportion of university grant or loan fees. Okay? How is it funded? I grew the whole community so I can be semi parasitical and grow my own student as well. So I'm doing it for my own selfish reasons, but I'm giving it away to everybody. In order that I can grow, if I grow, if I grow the whole field, my little corner will be successful. Thank you. I'll stop there. But thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
the reason why in Teams was that we have four campuses in Kampanet, and also it was a pandemic time then. And we have their uh, discussion channels in different themes, topics, and also we arrange some kind of uh, discussion meetings there. For example, last week we had a uh, <coughs> artificial intelligence discussion meeting, and there was over 100 teachers speaking and listening, discussing. Uh, then they also asked templates for teaching material. Well, we have, I don't even know how many disciplines we have in our universities, so we didn't make, make a template for a teaching material, but we did the planning template for a course and for a teaching session and so on. It's open in our, <coughs> our web page. And also they asked for the place to publish their open educational resources. And we have on our page TLC blog, where everyone in our personal can write. It's, we have also a, an editorial board there. And but we didn't uh, set up a repository for, for open educational resources, but we suggest they use the national library of open educational resources for publishing their their uh, material. Well, they asked for a chatbot, we didn't do that, we prefer the serve in person, and now, uh, how many years after, three, four years after this, we are happy to present a chat CPT for them, <laughs> kidding, but maybe they are happy for that, that's not our official tool for teachers. Uh, <clears throat> so, with all this, we aim to better all pedagogical and educational information and services into our open web page and there we also have open self-study materials for everyone, everyone to use they there are materials about pedagogical planning digital tools and such and also uh with them we support teachers in very different uh stages of their career and also, we hope that if somebody's planning to come to Dumbele and teach, we, we can represent us as, a, as an attractive employer. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> so these are some activities we have in TLC. Of course, our main aim to is to support our own teachers, but as I told you, the website is open. Anyone can take advantage of that. And if you click the next one, all of these Bloom activities contain all, some, some kind of uh, <coughs> open, open uh, aspects as well. We have some webinars and events open to anybody, but also uh, participate, for example, with Open Network Learning. It's not hosted by us, but we, we are in the network anyway. It's all <laughs> running out of time. Uh, this is just the website in a nutshell. This is not, as from the previous slide you could see, this is not all we have, not only the website, but all, all activities as well. But in the website we have a events calendar where teachers can find our uh, inner and, and open uh, events and trainings, and then the log news, uh, special interest groups, and also the help button where they can ask for pedagogical support. But not only, not only of them. <laughs> of course, if we have material on a website, that doesn't guarantee somebody's learning something. So, for example, in Farm University of Applied Sciences, we have built pedagogical development pro program, which is also, has also these competence-based batches uh, to support the and, and ensure that people take advantage of this material. And all the teachers should, for example, this year, they should do two batches from that constellation. These are just some examples here. And with the QR code, if you don't know what are digital open batches, you can move on to our page. And in the university, they are starting the same process very soon. Creating batches. yes. And this is something we asked last uh, December, perhaps, yeah. 
how features have built. Now, now that they have this uh, web page and the network is rolling, uh, how do they think today? They have found the material interesting, but they have lack of time. So they, they don't have enough time to really dig on that material. That's, that's sad. Uh, teachers say that their work is lonely, so this network is very useful to support them in their work. That's very yeah, really happy of that. And they still still hope that that we would have more face-to-face -face meetings now after the pandemic, of course. And uh, they ask different experts to visit their team meetings and such. And also, they hope that when projects build some kind of open educational material, we would be glad to publish them. And we are interested in yet know that. <laughs> so that's one problem. Not everyone are aware of this. And we continue to um, grow and But um, something about OER in Finland also and in our community. I think that uh, uh, we have in Finland open education and educational resources, but open science. And um, we at Thunder University, we are in the process of updating our our open science policy and this updated version also includes open education and open basic resources. Uh, as Lena said before, we have a library of open education resources in Finland. <coughs> you can use that uh, use that link. Uh, our Thunder University Library is the actor in open resources in our community. And then we have this exhibition of the country uh, as going to make a continuous flexible learning tray, and there is uh, all this that tray. Here is a picture of our work of the science and our own our we are sharing the material, so oh. okay. yeah. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> what you right. yeah. So, uh, one I welcome to the Welcome to the Welcome to the Administration is open, so so we want to see you there. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> we want to sign on time. We can take one very quick question for this one. You can go one side. Side side. Yeah. We've said that you're going to have to Please. <laughs> So uh, there's the link there again if you want to have a look at the slides or, or the um the the walk over there. So a little bit about me and my my journey. Uh, I sometimes struggle with trying to decide am I at the start of my research journey. Or am I in the middle of my research journey? Or will I be not pursuing this? I'm absolutely not near the end of my research journey. Um, this is what I kind of get up to. I'm an MD student at the DC Institute of Education in Ireland, and the Middle Institute of Education is Ireland only. Uh, entire faculty of education where you train teachers from early childhood all the way to sort of a higher education. We research along that entire spectrum of, of education and students with superior teaching and learning. My practice, uh, my day-to-day -day work, is that of an academic developer in Dublin City University with a focus on digital learning, and that role is, is my very I do some teaching, I do some research, I uh, do a lot of work around um, managing in the institution's uh, virtual learning environment, and involved in various initiatives and projects, such as uh, digital upskilling students, and uh, working in learning analytics and so on, which are, again, various interests uh, for previously I've held roles as a learning technologist in 
in both of these institutions as well. As part of the ID journey, uh, I just a ton of things uh, last year, so I'm in the research phase uh, at the moment, uh, with the hopeful completion date of 2024, I'm manifesting that out into the universe. So please manifest that with me so that I can get this finished uh, by, by next year. And I'm being supervised by Professor David Butler and Dr. Amy Costa, which are sure if you might be familiar with some of her work. She's a lot of work with the Irish around uh, issues strategies for schools. And Amy, of course, is here at the conference to give us a, a rousing cast presentation on chat GPT yesterday. Uh, but he's not here in the room today, so at lunchtime, we'll all have to find Amy and tell him that stop the students to give him a different I suppose the kind of big idea, the kind of thing I, I would like to do is research. We all have some great, you know, rich and great goals in research. But I'm very interested in telling students to become a bit more empowered in this datafied and data veiled world with uh, data. Is being collected and instructed from us every moment of the day. It's being used to monitor us and not just track us, pick our behavior, etc. I really want to help students develop some skills to uh, protect themselves in that kind of world. Um, I'm really interested in the link with openness. I'm really interested in and helping my university <coughs> to practice openness with data and instrumentation and be more transparent in our data processes, you know, and kind of break down that power dynamic between the network of the and I'm interested in developing kind of an educated approach towards uh, this group, which is So, uh, again, I'm not sure I'm this with this doctors. Uh, I'm not sure about one topic or about two topics. But as I said, those five of us, I said, are your LACDL. Uh, Center for Learning Analytics and Critical Data Literacy, which are the two areas that um, I'm going together in this research. So, learning analytics, <laughs> as you may be familiar with that term already, it's, 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 it's about um, measuring, collecting, uh, reporting on very granular data about students' learning behaviors, which is used to make them some informed decisions about how to optimize their, their learning experience. And uh, critical data literacy is. Um, um, Again, data literacy, digital literacy, information return, as mentioned earlier, yeah, uh, by, 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 by the attendee in Dave's plenary. And uh, data literacy is around obviously kind of developing those skills to organize data and work with data, uh, visualize data, interpret data. So critical data literacy is a little bit beyond that kind of technical focus on, around working with data without uh, having a kind of critical awareness, critical appreciation of how data is used and use is kind of one of the techniques of the <laughs> Let me just kind of reach the last bit of So, kind of the, 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 the problem with the issue I see, uh, I guess, is a lot, a lot of mixture emerging around this area at the moment. The society, uh, our lives, our work, etc., our societies, rather, uh, are becoming increasingly datafied. So, um, constantly, technology is ubiquitous, is data is ubiquitous, the data stream is flowing and growing, as one author put it. Uh, data is being collected and extracted from us uh, at uh, every point of day right now, right here. Uh, this data being collected uh, 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 on us, and this is the world that we live in. It's something that we're often not very conscious of, or it's something we don't quite understand what's going on. There is the need uh, to kind of develop an awareness. Uh, so what recently shows that citizens mostly are kind of aware uh, to the extent at which their data is being collected. I'm not doing it. Purposes is being used for, and where that data, you know, you may be aware that data can be kept on at a certain point in time for a specific purpose, and that could be uh, aggregated or moved on or combined down the line in some other data set. And for data, when the system if it goes, uh, you're, you're not really sure where it will end up, and there's a need to develop citizens' education on this. Uh, First, we go data literacy, and that kind of empowerment of that awareness of that criticality around when the data is a way to. Capture or protect yourself in this data find and data based society you're living in. Uh, of course, higher education institutions still exist outside of society and even uh, as universities and, uh, and education institutions collect a lot of data on our, on our learners. And we've always done that, and that's obviously part of education. We've been counting students for centuries and we've been counting their examples for, for centuries, so that's nothing, nothing new. Uh, but what is new about learning analytics, I suppose, is the granularity of the data we can collect as students. 
uh, scale, speed, scope, object, a very specific data you can capture on which things do and vanishes and so on. So that is perhaps what's uh, different to the abilities of your statement. Yeah, I think it's also not too bad. Uh, some shape is being that from students by the higher education. <laughs> Those students are mostly data subjects. You know, they don't have a view on the data set. So that's what I'm trying to do. Do you own or co own that data or that very young research? In a lot of cases, uh, they don't uh, or they're afforded the opportunity to interpret or look at their work at their institutions. Our sole examples, of course, where that's institutions are facing learning analytics for students in that program. And again, it's sort of the uh, summary of the ball or note view of how they're able to meet various others and to help develop self learning learning. So, our sole examples that yeah, on the whole, these students are very much into subjects, not into owners. And it's also noted that more of this data literacy trust is needed. And we wish to work with data, look at data, work with data sensors, and getting from hands on the practical. The data is important for, for developing uh, data literacy and uh, critical uh, data literacy as well. So, um, essentially, what do I want to do? This uh, is area of interest to me. Uh, as I said, I have some wonderful uh, high value contributions I want to make. But specifically, what I want to do, I want to work with some graduate students, essentially, and um, there are calls for uh, educational approaches to developing critical data literacy. I want to respond to those. Calls for greater education on students to participate in a, in a short course of data education and data literacy. Uh, I kind of quite a straightforward, pretty post intervention kind of a uh, kind of a job. So I want to kind of establish a baseline of their uh, creating data literacy before they engage in the intervention, and the intervention itself will see me kind of create a kind of a, a perfected tools for respective students, virtual learning environment data from them, giving it back to them as the points to kind of reflect on and uh, Teams and to this as an object to, 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 to think and see so that it's like thinking about the issues of data education and people who are interested and so on. And uh, of course, I don't need to do that in, in, in isolation, but I want us to come together and explore these issues and then data education and people who are interested in through discussion again to help uh, develop that appreciation and widen the perceptions of that. Uh, and then again, afterwards, as we can the 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 Working with them, looking at and examining their own data that the university has collected that help us find data for which the data in the world. But yeah, it's kind of a methods approach to one of the case study that is pushing to samples of not just students. So, from the sessions, you're taking kind of a technical focus to data literacy module at the moment, and uh, sort of kind of important data cases, working with Excel, learning how to visualize, learning how to make graphs, very technical stuff. I, I'd like to request them to participate in kind of widening beyond data literacy, start widening themselves into critical data literacy. And I'm also just in work with uh, students in teacher education programs in BDC. But again, they will be education professionals themselves, and if it's the first time, they will be connecting some of the data on their level. So I'm interested in their perspectives. Uh, in terms of timeline, where um, am, am I at again? I don't know. I, I, I don't know. Meaning about the middle of the not at the end. I mean, I have to convert it. I've seen that for most of my mistake. And I think it's going to have a developer mistake. And I'm not sure it's going to have to develop that. It's going to have to treat these students who want to give some some usability testing and kind of use some sort of light user centered design that they will use with the students to refine that to a really nice semester. And I'm hoping to pilot the education with students, which can be something that we need to get in that in the second semester. First of the research project in terms of collecting data, I'm going to do some short interviews to the students at the development stage, but it's a long way to develop the development tool. And then during that, I'm going to take a shot of the offshore courses in which we post surveys to establish the baseline and then for the synthesis of the two examples. So I'll be trying to do so by this time next year, you'd better send and say the very good recommendations.
as a result. Uh, and again, just kind of recap on that as well. This is a theme of my book, which at the end of this movie, and I'll tell the Paris students to work as a piece of the credit by the end of the field. I really want to practice that with this movie, do this sort of piece of the shit that I've never seen in the world. I don't know that we're not, not transparent with what we get from our students, and I want to sort of shift the environment. And be able to put some value in the transparency and the world. So, the final DC will be all of our assistance as well in the process of time swipes and stuff. And we keep it at the center of our systems in the future. That's our value that we can spice and value in our students. And then again, we'll use this educational approach to kind of improve the future. I have some benefit from the system. So lots of ideas when I come to OBR24, hopefully I'll have uh, some interesting additional insights to, 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 to share with you. Uh, that's all for you, so uh, thank you very much. Fantastic, thank you. I um, really like the idea of like, LinkedIn kind of data to buy, buy a lot of students as well. We're running just two minutes over just so we can give Rob the time off to start, but you still have time to get any sessions um, So we can take a minute or two for any questions that the audience might have for Rob. I have an um, understanding well, you collect data in the learning environment, okay? How do you cope with tools that are used not the so without the environment? For example, uh, EC generator or feedback tools or perusal. Mm. How do you cope with the learn learning activities which are taking place there? Yes, well, uh, that's an excellent point. Uh, we're looking to see most of our learning and most of our students are integrated into our VLE. Mm -hmm. So that's so that the student data is, 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 is protected. And again, the policy <laughs> role is to manage the, the, the university's VLE and quite, you know, uh, adaptive and constructive. Yeah. There is an issue, of course, the individual lecturers can and it might be true that they like yeah. the, the, the students. Um, and often they do so without true regards to, to have that data being protected and it's being protected. For the purpose of this research, I, 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 I don't have to have access to that, but I'm, I'm hoping this kind of dialogue or this sort of developing a, a value around protecting data might increase yeah. uh, It's not protecting data, I think students have to give consent of the data. So they give, for example, I'm working on a project now where we collect data from groups of Australia. And uh, it's to generate, for yeah. example, we connect them to the learning uh, goals. And the students give, um, has a dashboard on their development or learning task. And the students have a teacher, I don't know, but we manage to do, um, import the data. So if you want to know more about that, yeah. can we know that? Yes, okay. Yeah. 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 Yes, yeah. 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 Three minutes to get your next session. I'll see you later. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.